Okay, and in three, two, one. Marketing geeks. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my fine pleasure to introduce Dan Locke, everyone. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, that, first of all, first of all, I just gotta say from a geek perspective, for those of you who are only podcast listeners, we're gonna post this on our YouTube channel, but, but this man is standing behind two Iron Man outfits. And talk <laughs> about like, raising the bar of uh, like that you you walk into a meeting with the, this image it's like <laughs> and done. and don't forget he has a captain america shield right behind him as well that's right, right let's, there let's right not there. leave that out there right there oh right man there. you get you definitely get the geek <laughs> award of the day that's it i mean i'm, I'm, I'm a geek too right so I, <laughs> yeah what's the best way to <laughs> to represent is than this <laughs> Well, I, I've got so many questions for you because I'm 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 a I'm a fan of what you do. You do it very very well, mm. and uh, so. Uh, but for for those of our seven listeners who don't know who you are, mm. can you give us a, a little bit of your background and and how you became head of this empire? Mm. So I was I was born in Hong Kong and I immigrated to to Vancouver, Canada and North America when I was 14 years old. And as the only child in my family, I, my mom and dad got divorced when I was 16 years old. And so shortly after that, when I was 17, my dad actually went bankrupt. And as, as, a, young, as a teenager, I had no interest in, in business. Like not in a million years, I thought this is, would be what I do. Wow. <laughs> I had, I had no interest in business. I didn't know what entrepreneurship was and anything like that. I got into business by accident because I wanted to take care of my mom. And I knew I couldn't take care of my mom if I was just working in a, in a minimum wage job because I wasn't doing very well in school because the English language barrier. And, and I couldn't really know like where would I go in life. And so I just got into business because I thought that's something that I could, I could make a like, better living and provide for my family. And that was it. But after that, and then fast forward today, and this is where we are today, right? So who would you say was like um, a mentoring influence on you then? Because, you know, to go from not being interested in business to, to being a super success in business pretty fast, you achieved, uh, you achieved pretty early success. Yeah. What would you credit as the, the driving force that took you in the direction of business? And like, was there a specific mentor that really... Yes. Like took uh, took hold over you. Like it, tell, think, tell me. It's, it's it's interesting you mentioned that because sometimes sometimes they say now people know they say people see me on social media they follow me on social media and I hear this a lot. Oh, you know Dan Lok came out of nowhere and it just blew up on social media. The reality <laughs> is I've been online since two thousand and four. I've been marketing online since two thousand and four. I started my business when I was in high school, right? So I've actually been doing business for over two decades now. If you think about it, right? So. Because of that, and so I, it's not a short period of time, although I am relatively young, <laughs> the most, but I'm an old soul just because I have done a lot of things. I've tried a lot of things. I fail in a lot of things. But over the years, I've had three mentors. My first mentor, his name is Alan Jex. And Alan actually used to be uh, Gary Halbert's mentee. He learned corporate from Gary Halbert. Mm-hmm. And Alan taught me cooperating. I was a copywriter for his company. That's kind of how he uh, mentored me. First mentor. Second mentor is named Dan Pena. You've seen him on YouTube probably. Uh, and he's the claim to fame. Grew a company from zero to $450 million in the oil industry. And so that's Dan Pena. And then third mentor, which is the new mentor that I have uh, now, is his name is Mr. Dwayne Clark. And he runs a very, very successful a senior home, senior living business. So those are the three main mentors for me. Well, when you say you started your first business, um, this is, you had already migrated to the United States at that point, right? When you started your first online business, is that correct? No, so I was, I was just, first business was just landscaping. I was just more Okay, <laughs> just landscaping, as, okay. As a young, young kid, I was trying to uh, do delivery business. I was trying to fix computers for people. I tried vending machines. So I try a lot, like just like most yeah. young people, a lot of the, the, the side hustle, I guess. I, <laughs> I try a lot of different things and they, they didn't work for me until I, in my early 20s, I found my first mentor, Alan, when he taught me how marketing and cooperating and how to, how, to, how to get customers, right? How do you communicate? Uh, that's when things turn around for me. That was a turning point. 
So what, let, let's go back to like the first successful business. Then you're in your twenties. You're you've just uh, been mentored a bit on on internet marketing and copywriting. Mm. So the the very first business that actually achieves success. What what would you say? Like we have a, a lot of listeners that are we have a mix. I mean, we have some people that are executives in marketing. We have some people that are college students that are wanting to get into marketing. Mm. But for the ones that are kind of getting started. What would you say has been was the most important lesson that you learned in the very beginning to like build the foundation of a what became a solid business? Mm, good question. So before I met Alan, I had tried all kinds of businesses. I started, I counted, started and failed at 13. 13 businesses, <laughs> right? Yeah. Before having the quote unquote first success. And I looked at all of that. Why did those businesses fail? They all failed because I had an idea and I thought it was good. I could do something to make a living, but I actually didn't know anything about marketing, right? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what business you're in. Marketing is a very, very important function of business, right? Yeah. Because that's what brings in customers. So when Alan taught me how to do marketing, so I've worked with him for almost a year, almost like a volunteer for his company for one year. And afterwards, then I started my own one-man advertising agency, kind of a copywriter, yeah, working yeah. from home, writing copy for people. And from there, I was making early 20s, making about $10,000 a month as a copywriter. Now, for your audience listening to this, maybe $10,000, it may, may not be a lot of money, but back then for me, it was a lot of money. Right? It was six figure income as a young guy that I've never seen so much money in my life. Right? So that's the first success because I developed the ability to, to market. Right? Yeah. And that the was- confidence. And the confidence there too, I'm sure. So I didn't know about much confidence back then. It's okay, uh, but I, I, I at least it, it showed me that I could do it. Yeah, when you go from not making a lot of money to making ten thousand dollars in a month, I'm sure that kind of boosted your your confidence a bit, right? When you mm. when you're young, and mm. that's like, and, the, and you're getting your business off the ground, that must have boost, been like right? a big boost. Mm, it, it, at first, it felt the, the kind of the imposter syndrome. I felt like is it, <laughs> is, that a, is that a fluke? Is it like? Uh, are really people paying me to write stuff? And like, it's, it's pretty crazy. It took me a while to accept that. Though. Yeah. Now I've got, I've got, a, I've got this question. Cause I, I want to go back a little bit further when you came over from Hong Kong and, and you, you, you've, you've mentioned before in other places that you're, you didn't have a good command of the language. Mm-hmm. And then your, your father and mother start having these issues. And then he, you know, your world just falls apart at this very, very early age. Yeah. What, What was that experience like for you to be a kind of a stranger in a strange land? Also, you know, Hong Kong was just given uh, to back to China from the British and Hong Kong is slightly different than mainland China. So, so first of all, what was it like for you to, you you must've felt a little alien on a lot of different levels. What was that experience like for you? When I first came here, uh, I couldn't speak a word of English. Didn't, didn't know anybody, right? And no money, just me and my mom, right? We had a little bit of savings. We moved here. We were living in a one-bedroom condo in Surrey. Hmm. Um, in case you don't know, Sur- Surrey is kind of hood in our, in our city, okay? That okay. area. So and you were 14, correct, when you came? Yeah, 14 years old. 14. So okay. the, first, the first week, I was afraid to go out. I was staying in my home because I, I just... I. I don't know. I don't know. I'll talk to people. Would they talk to me? It's, it's in, a, in a very strange environment, right? From like going to just, you, just as you go to a new city and it's just like, it's odd. It's a little bit weird. And you're, as a young guy, I was afraid. So I was in the beginning, very pissed, pissed off. I was pissed off at my parents. Why would they want to move? And why, why am I in this country? Why, why I lost all my friends? What the hell is going on? Right. Um, just a little backstory. When I was in Hong Kong, the reason we moved, it's not because of 1997. The reason we moved because I was getting into a lot of trouble as a young teenager. I was hanging around with gang members and stuff like that. So my father had to bail me out from the police station. But the police officer told my father, you got to get yourself out, get your son out of this environment. Otherwise, he'll, he'll end up in some bad place, right? And my father immediately said, okay, took me from Hong Kong and boom, just put me in North America, right? So it's, that was what was going on. So when I was going through to, to school, I was one of the only three Chinese in my school, right? Wow. Because I spoke funny and I was a hundred, I don't know, 10 pounds. It was like a monkey, right? <laughs> very so small. I, yeah, very tiny, small. I spoke funny. Mm-hmm. And I got, I got bullied. I got beat up. I mean, I was picked on every damn day, right? And, and because of that, I had a lot of these, confidence issue 
And what helped me was actually because one night I was flipping through the cable, I saw Bruce Lee. Oh yeah. <laughs> Return of the Dragon. Classic. Classic, right? Chuck Norris. Bruce Lee was someone who couldn't speak a word of English, went to Rome, kick ass, take names, right? <laughs> he became my hero that night, right? And so that's when I took an interest in martial art and, and learn and, and build self-confidence. So definitely martial art has helped me tremendously in, in my career. And, but through that period of time, it was, it was very difficult. However, looking back, if I didn't come, didn't come here, if I was staying in Hong Kong, would I have accomplished what I've accomplished? I don't think so. I don't think so. How many languages do you speak now? Do you speak just English and, uh, and uh, so Mandarin? Speak, uh, English, Mandarin, and Cantonese. I speak. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So, uh, and you know, it's it's like also your story is really a testament to why I- I- immigrants can really make a difference in this melting pot that that is called America. Because the people that you have influenced, the 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 amount of people that you employ, the amount of money you've generated for other businesses. Uh, I, you know, I, I am of the firm belief that a human mind has tremendous potential, no matter where it is. And if we don't give a human mind an opportunity to explore its full potential. We are limiting the human race, right? I totally agree. That's why I have very little patience for people saying that, oh, you know, it's kind of hard, it's difficult, and I can't make it, and this and that. I said, just if you think you can make it in here, like <laughs> if this is hard, just imagine you go to a foreign country and you don't speak the language and try to make it there. Yeah. yeah. Like people have no idea what is hard, right? <laughs> they, they don't understand what that is like. So, and especially it's interesting because before I was a copywriter, I flung English twice when I was in high school. <laughs> very right? different skills though. They are very different. English, English writing and copywriting are quite different, but yeah, yes. I, I get it though. It's, it's interesting. I, it, was, it, was, it was one of my greatest weaknesses, right? Talking mm-hmm. to people, could speak language, writing, and. And that's now I turned it into my greatest strength. Yeah. Well, the language of influence is different than the language of um, literature, I would say, in like the United States. So there is, there's quite a distinction there. Now, I will say that um, it's pretty incredible because you didn't come over to the United States until you were 14 years old. And, you know, if I didn't know better, I would think that you were raised in the United States because you, you have a, a pretty, you don't, you have a, I mean, a pretty mild accent and you speak, yes. you have a very strong command of the language from what I hear. So, yes. Well, thank you. I appreciate well, that. Yeah. And, and confidence on the stage. I mean, you're a two time TEDx, uh, TED, TED talk speaker as well. Yeah. I'm a TEDx speaker. Yes. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. So, so what would you say to somebody who is like just starting out, right? They're, they're maybe even, uh, say middle age, they have like some dumb podcast. They're trying to figure out what to do with their lives. What would you say to somebody who's like, okay, if you're starting out, the mountain that you have to climb, because you've mentioned in other spaces that you work for five years solid, without a break, 10 to 12 hours a day, right? So how, it's not just the hard work, it's part, it's a lot of it, but, but what would you say to somebody who's just starting out and and looking up that hill and going, I don't know if I can actually pull this off. How, How would you respond to that? Mm, I think, first of all, let's define that mountain, whatever the success that people want. And everybody wants different things, right? Some people, mm-hmm. they say, hey, I want to build a good business that's a, you know, I can work from home, I have freedom, a lifestyle entrepreneur, I'm generating six-figure income, I'm a, I'm a happy person, right? I can spend time with my kids, with my wife, and I'm, I'm good, right? That's one mountain. Or you say, you know what? No, I want to build a seven-figure business. I want to, I want to build something a little bit bigger. Or someone who wants to build a global organization. Like those are very different mountains. Like one is like a small mountain, one is like Mount Everest, right? <laughs> it's still a mountain, but it requires a different level of sacrifice. It requires very different level of sacrifice. So when you understand that, then I always, myself, I always reverse engineer, meaning who do you have to be in order to do that? Not what you have to do, because we always go to the, how, the what to, how to do something. On the internet, there's no lack of how to. You have how many podcasts you can listen to, how many videos you can watch. It's not about that. It's the who. Who do you have to be? It's very simple. You will never be a millionaire with a $50,000 a year habit. Right? People operate from still that mentality. And that's why I'm such a big proponent of mindset to, to jump to this. So think about back then, 
my identity was a copywriter. That's who I was. Okay, I was a copywriter. And I transitioned into being more a marketing consultant. Okay, I was a marketing consultant. And then I was transitioning to internet marketing, an internet marketer. People see us, see us, we're a copywriter, we're a marketer with this, right? But now I look at what I do. I said, well, I have copywriting skill, but I'm not a copywriter. I, I have marketing skill, but I'm not a marketer. I, I, have, I have speaking skill, but I'm not a speaker. So the identity I have today is I am the CEO, which is what I do. I'm the CEO of a global digi, um, media and education company. That's what I do. So I make the identity shift first, then I go get the how-to, if that makes sense. Right? Yeah, because the, the, you see you, the word becomes the, the law, the, the word, the, what you right. utter, what you say That's becomes right. reality. And I've, right. I've known so many people who, who they limit themselves with this type of uh, messaging to themselves on a regular basis. It's, it's yeah. just it's continuously telling the same story will limit where you go in life. I just want to add something because this, I think that that metaphor or not even a metaphor, but what you're describing and the way you take on identities is it's important to separate behaviors from identities. Mm. And this goes down to things like for people with the suffer from addiction, even like yes. it's one thing to say to identify like the addiction is part of my person, my identity, but it's another thing to say that it's, you know, the behavior, it's a behavior that I identify with, but it's not my it's not my sole identity because I think it gets dangerous when you take on certain things as your exactly. sole identity. Just, just, just like people say that, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm trying to quit smoking. Yeah. Well, for people who want to try smoke, you, you, because the identity means I'm still a smoker trying to quit smoking. For someone who doesn't smoke, well, I'm not. Yeah, I'm they not, don't even think about it. They don't think yeah. about it. They, it's not. You're smoking or not smoking. You're, you can't be. You can't be trying to quit smoking. You're doing one or the other. So it's uh, the same thing. When you're an entrepreneur, are you? Are you? Do you see yourself being that, or you, you're still? I'm a nine to five guy trying to do that. Right? Yeah, it's a very different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most impressive things that I've seen about you, Dan, is that you've built a massive following. Like you have, uh, you have 1.7 million YouTube followers. You have millions on social media. You've built this like huge, this huge tribe of people that are engaging with you. Mm. And, you know, here we are, uh, Anders and myself have been starting a podcast. We've been, uh, we've, we've made more of an emphasis on uh, attracting our own tribe. But I wanted to, I wanted to hear uh, from you, like, what, what have you found to be some of the most important areas as far as like attracting and building relationships with your, uh, with your clientele, with your prospects, uh, mm. building that tribe? Can you talk a little bit about like how you were able to build such a big tribe and how, uh, and you have a, a, you know, a strong reputation in the community as being like a global influencer. So tell me just a little bit about what identity you adopted to, um, to have that, to achieve that kind of success as well. That's a good question. Uh, let me just lay a foundation first. Okay. There, most people, they talk about, I, I want to build a social following. Then how, how do I have more fans? How do I get more yeah. likes? How do I get more followers? I say, I have zero interest in social media. Zero fucking interest. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I want to get a t-shirt that says that actually. Okay. okay like zero. Cause most people that use social media for pleasure. I use it for profit. Yep. Okay. So there's a big difference between a social media following and social capital. I'll get into that. I'm interested in accumulating social capital. I have zero interest in building a social following. There's a big difference. Okay. Social following, meaning I get followers, I get likes, I get all these things. And I was reading an article. There was a, an in, uh, Instagram uh, influencer and teenager and with 2 million followers on Instagram, couldn't sell 36 t-shirts. Wow. How many influencers are broke? A lot. <laughs> right? You and I know, like, you, you can't go to the bank and say, hey, man, I, I got no money, but, but I, I got a lot of followers. Can I, can I deposit some likes? Like, you can't do that. <laughs> If you don't understand. I can do that. <laughs> right? I do that here in the Netherlands. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good, right? You know, I should close to some then, <laughs> right? So, you know what I mean? So, it, it's not what it is. It's why you want it. Yeah. I mean, there's vanity metrics or like likes and things like that. And then there's metrics that actually convert to business and cash. There's a distinction. Yeah. So, when I'm talking about social capital, on the other hand, is right now, the most valuable thing the right now in the world, it's not financial capital. It's not money. The proof of that is a lot of VCs, venture capitalists, they're going out of business because they have capital that they cannot deploy. There's more money ever, more capital now in the financial market than ever in human history. More money looking for deals, not the other way around. 
So, but I'm not Russian. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not like an oligarch. I can't like you know change. No, what what I'm saying. <laughs> what I'm saying is, financial capital is one thing, and people think that's valuable. It's not because if you have social capital, you can convert that into financial capital. Or you can convert that into what I call relational capital, which I believe those, that's, those are the two new goals in the 21st century. And also human capital. Mm-hmm. Those now, three. Now, where does AI fall into kind of that matrix for you? Data, right? To me, big data, human capital, social capital, relational capital, those big four, which is what I all, what the, it's all I focus on, right? It's not, it's not just tech or it's not just, put it this way, let, let's hypothetically. Today, they say if I was to raise capital using my brand, I could raise money like this. Why? Because of the social capital that I've accumulated, right? No different than, than you know, so-and-so starting his fund. It's the same thing. If I wanted to, I don't want to, but that's what I'm talking about. So that's why it's more valuable. And, and there's so much truth in the power of your personal brand and having that tribe foundation. I mean, I look at like, I was just watching an interview um, with Gary Vaynerchuk on, on YouTube the other day, and he was talking about how he got back into the wine business. And he basically, without spending any money outside of his social capital that he built through his- uh, You saw like his $2 million or something like that, right? It, oh. Yeah, it was, a, it was a ridiculous number, uh, just selling, getting back into wine, and all based on the following that he built through VaynerMedia. Yeah. Or, you know, not nothing, no paid advertising, no cold traffic, all from that following, he was able to sell, yeah, whatever the numbers were, they were ridiculous. Yeah. And there's just so much power in, in having those tribes these days. Um, beyond like, uh, beyond though the social capital, what, what are the other key metrics that you see like between those businesses that are, that thrive and then those that ultimately are going to crumble and fall? Mm. So when I saw it, let's take YouTube for example, right? At the time <laughs> when I, made a decision, it was about four years ago, I think 2014, about, about. I decided to be on YouTube. At first I had no choice of being on YouTube, but I upload some videos. And what I saw in the space, in the, in the business space, there were only a couple, a couple influencers who have accomplished what I thought, like, like a, over a million subs at the mm-hmm. time, like very, very few, close to a million subs. And I thought, okay, I think, I think there's a, a void here that's a little bit different than with my personality, with my story, just my own brand that would be different. So I made a decision to kind of focus on, on that area. Uh, the way I approach social media, it's very simple. I don't look at social media as number one, I just post some stuff or we purpose some stuff. I run it like a media company. I have a media division. So within social media, the way I approach it, I'll go into tactics, but I just want to give you the setup why okay. I do social media. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have 22 full time just on social, just on my brand. Wow. So I have one person just on Facebook organic, <laughs> two people just on Facebook pay, five people on video production. Like one, I have one key leader director for each platform. One person just on LinkedIn, which is I think the weakest at this point, but I'm going to make it strong. So you can see like I run it like a business. I don't run it. Oh, here's something cool that I do. No, I run it like a media company because I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. So I approach it like with an entrepreneurial spirit, right? So yeah. that's, first of all, that's the setup. Now, in terms of tactics, everything we do, I track data, I make decisions, not based on assumptions, but based on facts. We look at video. I take, let's take a YouTube. Most people, they upload video. Oh, I don't know if it works or not. How come I'm not getting traction? You know what we do? We look at a thumbnail. We look at the title, I look at retention, I look at the time, I look at the view time, everything is numbers driven, and then we come up with conclusions on how do you make that better? That's just on YouTube, forget everything else. And that, yeah, that yeah. tool is free, folks. It is free to use and very easy to learn. Yeah. You really break down, I mean, uh, I imagine you look at things like colors and like things like that when you're looking at thumbnails too, all that? Everything, we test, we split test thumbnail. Wow. So you notice everything we do, people say, I have influencers. Dan, I want to be like you. They come to my place one day. They follow me one day. Say, I don't want to be like you. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> like, never mind. I didn't realize how much. Never mind. Did. Like when they see what we, like we run it. Like when they see that, I'm like, holy, I, I, I can't yeah, do that. It's a whole other animal when they see. It's a whole, uh, like I'm talking successful influencers. Yep. Right. They walk into the see that setup. They're like, shit, which is good. 
It is good. It, it's what, that's what separates you from everybody else, too. It's yeah. a fair of entry, right? And I'd, I'd like to touch on this just for a moment because, uh, you know, what you're talking about reminds me a little bit of what George Harrison, my favorite Beatle, uh, once said. When someone asked him what it was like to be a Beatle, he said, well, listen, that time in my life, it was like wearing a suit and I wore the Beatles suit yeah. and that was what I did. But then one day the suit didn't fit me anymore and I took it off and I reminisce on that the way I would reminisce of an old suit. And, and, and so, you know, he had a certain persona that he, he uh, provided and, and uh, but with you, uh, your brand is very like, uh, it's very young. It's like super, you know, like you, you're a very strong speaker. You're very charismatic. You're a dynamo. You don't stop. Right. And so, so, and, 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 you know, obviously this is no big secret that part of that is, is the, the, the role that you're playing, right? That's your brand. Yes. yes. So how how do you? Because you can't do that all the time. You would yes. burn out. Yes. So what do you do when you're not wearing the Den Luck entrepreneur suit? Mm. How do you like detach yourself and relax and uh, uh, get the yin? Good question. And what you see on social media, like people, they may be put on different masks and and different different show and all that. Uh, I, to me, it's, it's too tired to do that. What you see here, what you see on social media, it's me, it's just louder. You hang out with day to me, day to day, it's the same. I'm exactly the same, just less loud. Well, we're going to Burning Man, my friend. It's, <laughs> less, it's just less, like, less, less loud. But it's what, because it, I don't want to build my life around social media. I think that's very dumb, okay? Because I, I don't want to do that. It's, it's too exhausting. Last thing I want is to, to, to build something and then I don't like that person, right? I would rather, I'd rather be hated for, I, for who I am than to be loved by who I'm not, right? Yeah. I, don't want, I don't want to do that. When people meet me on the street, when people meet me, I'm just saying. In fact, most of the time they say, oh, you're a lot nicer in person than I thought. So, it's, so I, what you see, this is, it's not putting on a show. I live and breathe. This is, this is what I do. People, it's what I do. And people think... <laughs> People might think, oh, you buy this for, for social. No, it has nothing to do with social. It's what I like to collect. I just no, like, I bought it because it's fucking awesome. <laughs> it's just, it's, oh, you, you do it because, oh, it's Marvel. Are you leveraging Marvel? No, it's, just, it's what I like to collect, dude. Right? It's, it's, it's like Bruce Lee. It's what I love. It's my martial it's it's, I just build social media around my life, and I share bits and pieces of it, and people, oh, they resonate. But it's not for, oh, I do it for, it's a marketing like spectacle or anything like that. No, it's not at so all. So how do you center yourself through all of this? Because, you know, chaos is a ladder. You, you have a lot of controlled chaos around you that you use as a ladder. But how do you center yourself through all of this? Every morning I have a morning ritual. I do an attitude gratitude. So I am, because of my martial art background, I think it taught me a lot. Like in martial art, I mean, Asian martial art, right? Not, not like UFC, I beat you. Not honestly. MMA, yeah, for not sure. Not MMA. Not like I want to I wanna beat the other guy. I'm the best. I'm the strongest. Asian martial art, it's like the philosophy is always, it doesn't matter how strong you are. There's always someone who's bigger, stronger, faster, right? It, it teaches you to be humble. So I don't look at, I think people look at what I do, like, oh, Dan, you're successful. You're this and that. You know how I see myself? Like, this is where I am. I want to be there. So this, I don't, I don't feel that, oh, I'm, I don't feel very successful, right? Because I don't compare myself with, every, I compare myself with me, what I could do, right? So when you look at it that way, then it's. And, and I mean, from what I gather, like you said, you, you are, you're not putting on a show when you're doing all this work. This is what you love to do. You to actually have passion for it. And, you know, they say, like, if you, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And that's kind yeah, of what I guess. It would not be possible if I don't, first of all, if I don't like it, no, no one can ask me to do stuff I don't like to do yeah. at, at this point in my career, right? If I'm making a video, I'm doing an interview, I'm doing things like that because I like to do. Yeah, you know what? Do I mention my stuff? I mention my brand, mention my book. I mean, if someone buys my book, they don't buy my book. It doesn't make a difference to my life. It, it's zero, right? Uh, so it doesn't really matter, but I like to do it. Um, but selectively, I want to do it. 
And so it's then it becomes a play and fun and, and it's great. I integrate it with my life. And, and so the whole thing is, is think about on YouTube, I go, I go over a thousand videos. Can you imagine making a thousand videos if you don't like to do it? Be pretty horrible. <laughs> it would be like, yeah. it's just put a, put a, like, put a gun in my mouth. I mean, God, it's like, it would be, it's just like, just kill me, please. Like, it's not, no, it's just, hey, you know, I like to do it. I like to teach. I love it. Right? It seems to me. It seems to me that you're you're actively practicing regularly. Uh, you have a practice of gratitude yes. and in humility. And it seems like those those are the like the things that you know you remind yourself. And this is like it's interesting. They actually read a study about this uh, on the internet, so I'm sure it's legit. <laughs> but that uh, that most successful people do this, where they have a gratitude journal and they, they practice humility in some way. And uh, I, I, I have no doubt that's added to your success because there seems to be a lack of humility and uh, gratitude in our world today. Mm. And, and I, I, I take pride in, in terms of people who have, first of all, who have worked with me, people who have done business with me. Forget, people see, sometimes they see on social, they, they watch one video. I don't like you. I don't like the way you say certain, certain things. Or, or they come to a conclusion watching like three minutes. It's like you read a book, you read like two paragraphs. I don't like this book, right? <laughs> Versus reading the whole book. I'm pretty proud if you actually talk to anyone who have, or I've done business with, who I've worked with, I think you'll find, I won't say 100%, but a good 99% would say, hey, you know, love to do business with Dan. It's, it's great. So if they give you a fair chance, you will eventually win them over, basically. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it's, yeah, that's because your reputation. You can, do all, you can do all the hype, you can do all the promotion, do marketing, PR. At the end of the day, I would not be able to build the company that we have today if we don't deliver. So how, many, how many total employees do you have now? Because you mentioned how many you've dedicated, I think you said 22 are dedicated to individual social media network or platforms. Probably within, because we have different companies, with the core team is about 60. Okay. Uh, and then we have about another 120 uh, closers internally. And I take it they're just, uh, they're more not full-time, they're just kind of working they're full-time on- full-time commission uh, base. Full-time commission. Okay. Yeah. So let me ask you more about your system of how you, because you have, you, you have several businesses. Um, and I noticed, for instance, uh, I was looking for your book, uh, FU Money, mm. and uh, which uh, FU, we all know, stands for Far Out, man. And, uh, I thought you were going to uh, say Tofu, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but, but you, you have a landing page for the book where you will, if you collect their email address, you will give them the book for free and the audio book. And I just, I just wanted to break down more from like the sales perspective of, of yeah. the mechanism. You can ask me, you can ask me all kinds, like how I broke it down and share all that with you. Yeah, well, the, the, the mechanism of how you set it up was great because you have the landing page, the lead in, uh, and then you go to the thank you page, which has the, uh, the sales like thank you letter. Uh, and then you say, watch this, you've got 45 minutes to, to, to we get this stuff together. Mm. And you've collected someone's uh, information so, so talk a little bit about like these processes you set up to generate income from these things you create, like the books. Mm, so you, basically, it, this is like in, in, inter, in intern marketing, this is not new, it's pretty basic 101, right? You build your social media following, you run ads, warm traffic, cold traffic, you put them through a funnel, right? You get them to opt into some kind of free offer and you build a list through email, you would build a relationship and then you make an offers from time to time. Like very, this, this, this has been around a long time, been back in direct mail days, right? This is not new. Uh, I think what is new is in terms of different types of funnels out there. And, and Russell Brunson, my good friend, I mean, from ClickFunnel, he, he teaches this a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a self-liquidating offer? Is it a, a, a tripwire offer? Meaning that you've got to give them free, like they, they, they pay shipping and handling, and then you can have multiple upsells. Is it a webinar uh, funnel? So it depends on what you sell, right? The different types of funnel. However, I think most people, they get it wrong is they try to sell on social. That is not how you do it. You build a relationship on social and then you give them something else and say, hey, if you want more of this, it's just basically, you're not trying to make a sale. You're asking people, put up your hand if you want more of this. Mm -hmm. I want more of this. Okay, great, click. Let me give you something worth of value. From there, you give them some more value and say, hey, if you really like this, the free things, the free stuff, my pay stuff is so much better. 
and then a percentage would say, hey, yeah, I would want the, 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 give me the full thing, right? Give me the full meal. Give me the, the, the next offer, the next thing I could do. And then boom. And then that's how people would buy, right? It's not complicated, but most people, I think they make it too complicated. <laughs> now, is that how you're structuring the marketing for your new book? Uh, let's, talk, let's, let's transition into the new book because you have it in yes. front of you there. It's called Unlock It by Dan uh -huh. Locke. Yes. And uh, we'll, let's start with, uh, let's start with, tell, tell me, uh, tell the listeners a, a brief summary of what, um, what the book is about um, and then also where they can get it. And then let's talk a little bit about the, about the campaign even that you're using to market. So, so the, this, the book is the, the worst marketing campaign I've ever done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Let's prelude with that now. <laughs> no, seriously, it's, if it's a marketing thing, I, I would say that's a complete failure because I put in way more effort and time than mm -hmm. return. Yeah. Right? So people ask me why they write a book. Exactly what you said. I, almost nine years ago, I wrote FE Money. In my late 20s, right? I wrote the book. And it's one of my most, uh, that book, it's one of the most well-known. We've got so many, many, many. Great I mean, title. Yeah. Great title. It's such a good title. Yeah, A lot of people have read it. A lot of people rave about it. A lot of people download it. I mean, download, I think we've had over like a million downloads, like from what you saw the landing page. Okay. It's, it's, it's a huge number. Why did I write this book? Because I wrote that when I was late 20s. I was brash. I was arrogant. I was just a brash, arrogant yeah. guy, right? Because I felt like I was the hot shit. Oh, I wasn't. And I learned now as I've evolved that that's like Dan Lok 1.0. Now I'm like Dan Lok 3.0. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've learned I'm, lear I'm, I'm a little bit older, a little bit more mature. I've learned a lot of different lot of lessons in my life. The problem is because that book was so well known that people would, associate, oh, Dan Locke is F you money. I said, but that's me in my late, you know what I mean? It's like your late 20s and today yeah. it's a different person, right? Very different. It's different. Person. And I've gone through so much in my life. My father's passed away, a lot of things in my life, right? Then I'm like, you know what? I need someone to know, especially because of my reach, that I don't want people to think, oh, that's what Dan is about. Oh, that's what he is teaching. I it's just, I take what the influence I have very seriously. I have so many young people, they follow me, right? So, oh, they, oh, you have your money. I said, that's nine years ago. That's not, that's what, what you should follow today, right? You shouldn't be that guy. So that's how this book came about. I thought, mm -hmm. I need a new book that would communicate what I believe today, right? What, what people ask me, how do, I, how do I do what you do? How do I become successful? What are the values? What are the principles? I said, this it took me such a long time because when I, when I, at the time when I finished a few money, I, I said to myself, I never, never, never want to write another book. <laughs> I bet not. You know, you know thing with books though, is that I, I do think that there's a misconception that a lot of people get into writing books because they think that they're profitable up front. They see like New York times bestsellers. And my belief, and I'm sure you kind of share this is that you don't write a book to make money. You write a book to build branding and we got to let people in on your, like your soul, almost your, your, uh, your exposing your true self, your teaching, your adding value and you're building relationship capital through people that actually absorb that and read the content because they're going to feel closer to you. They're going to get value from it. And if they feel like they get value from you, they're likely to go buy your other stuff. Uh, is that kind of your philosophy or what do you, how do you yes, take on hundred percent? That's why I've written so many books in my life. True. Yeah. But not for this one, because okay. when I wrote, when I wrote this, it's, it's coming out in two months. Like I really don't need the book to, to build fall. I already have fallen. You have it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I definitely don't need to fall into buy the book. It's, you know what I mean? So from a business decision point of view, it's not a very wise business decision. Like so this is almost like a, like a soul cleansing for you. Like you're like, you're, yeah. you're like, you're like writing a wrong almost. It feels like, like. Yeah, it's writing a wrong. It's, it's give people an, an updated version. And it's also the answer of like all these questions I get, how do you do this? How do you do that? Just now I've got something I could point to. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's my, I'll give you a quick story if I could. Please. This book is supposed to be out in like literally two months ago. <laughs> okay, we delayed till now, till uh, October, September, October ish. Do you know why the delay? I don't know why. Two months ago, I, uh, well, before we published, go to the final print, I had the manuscript, the final man manuscript that we had already many revisions, editing, all of that. I was holding the manuscript, I went through it. This is now going, now I'm going to have to 
hand it to, to Forbes, right? Forbes pub, uh, Books publishing it, a publisher. Like they're saying, hey, Dan, if this is good, we go to print. Like this is good to go. I said, no. They did like, what do you mean no? I said, this is not good enough. Well, it's good enough. We, we review it. We've worked on it for months. It's, we, it's, let's go. Like, it's, you know, because we have so many, like, when you delay a book launch, like, it just creates a whole, yeah. like, it's huge thing, right? I said, no. No, no, no. We got to publish it, Dan. No. I took the entire manuscript. I trashed it. Wow. And I said, we're going to rewrite it. What are we going to rewrite it? Like, you got to either make some changes in, in, cha- in sections. We, we, you don't like a chapter. Can you? No. We could scrap the whole thing. Blank document. We start from scratch. From the table of content. That's why the delay. So what, what, was it, what was it that you, was it like, a, like you were feeling the energy of what you had written? I mean, like, what was the moment? Like, what kind of transpired through you to make that decision? That's a pretty big decision. It's a huge decision. Like that decision cost me so much time, effort, and, and, and money, right? But I said, it's just, the content of it, I felt it was trying a bit to, to because I know the book is going to go in, this book is going to go into all the major airport in North America, right? Yep. You see in Hassan, you, you see. So I was writing with that frame that I, like there's certain things, okay, because it's going to be, it's going to be in bookstore, it's going to be Barnes and Nobles, all those, you know, I need to write it a certain way. You know what I mean? To yep. be more mass friendly. And the publisher was pushing me for that. Like, you, you know, you shouldn't say this, you shouldn't say that and all that. I'm like, at the end, it just, it felt like it's part of me. It's piece, of, but it's not me. Yeah. That's what I felt uncomfortable. And I think what, what you, what your story kind of reminds me of, cause I'm a big movie buff um, is, is like these directors that have made it big and then they go on to do their passion projects afterwards. Mm-hmm. And to me, this sounds a lot like this is your passion project. Yes. You're yes. not, um, you could have released this already and it would have been, it would have been profitable and it probably would have been potentially more profitable possibly. Yeah. Um, but you you, you wanted to do it the right way, do it your way. And, and that's intriguing. So, so, yeah. So and I rewrote it in a way that's like, because it, again, at first I was, I wrote it for everybody. Yeah. Then I changed my whole mindset. No, I'm just going to talk to some, I don't care if that person is 20 years old. It's a 20 year old Dan Locke or 60 year old Dan Locke. It doesn't matter. Right. It's, it's me. Like I wanted, this is me, right. My soul, all walks of life. I don't care if you're running a global company, you're running a hundred million dollar company. You're thinking of quitting a job. I've got something that I want to share. Right. So from there, so I changed the whole thing and, and the publisher was shocked and we argued back and forth because it was such a big thing. I said, no, give me time. And that's why the delay. And I'm glad it's finished. And I'm very, very happy with the, the final manuscript. Every page, every, everything. I'm like, yep, that's... It's obviously not about money because if you wanted it to be about money, you would have released the first version and you would have, and again, it probably would have been fine. There's no money. I mean, this, this book this cost me six figure. Cost yeah, and... and- it seems like to me, like your hero's journey has been one where the first books have been about creating mechanisms to further your business. Yeah. It sounds like this is the first book that comes from wisdom. And it's like you cross the Rubicon to go, no, this, this is not part of the machine. This yeah, is not part of the machine. coming from a place of, of yeah. inner knowing. Yeah, that's why when you buy the book, it's like, oh, what's the funnel? Like I could have done this book and then free shipping and then funnel and all that. I've got, all, I, I don't need to do it with this book. So your one-time offer, your profit maximizer, all the yeah, wonderful profit stuff. Maximizer, up there, <laughs> you can do all that. And I know how to do all that. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do uh, this. So where, where do our listeners get the book? You sold me. I'm going to order my copy of the book, but where, where, about, where is everybody going to go to get the book? You can go to Amazon and get it. Okay. Oh, www.unlockitbook.com. Unlockitbook.com. Unlockitbook.com. You can also get it either way. doesn't really matter. Yeah. And is your, do you still have the, uh, the FU money funnel? Is that still active as yes. well? Yes. What's the, what's the link for that book as well? Uh, FU money.com. FU money.com. Love it. <laughs> that's, that's the, that's the Mac marketing mechanism. If you want to see how a, that funnel generated, I don't mind sharing because it's kind of public knowledge, right? Uh, Russell Brunson, you know, they've got the two common club, yep. right? That funnel did, eight, uh, did eight figure in eight months. Wow. Wow. That's eight incredible. Figure. You got, you got the two comma club award for that one. Yeah, the eight figure, eight figure award. 
the, the 10 million award. Yeah. We've got to wrap it up here, but I got uh, just a couple more questions. First of all, if, if, if the Dan Locke who has this book went back in time and talked to that 15 year old Dan Locke, what would you say to that person? You don't know shit. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah, you don't know shit. You think you're somehow, you think you're smart. You think you're this and that, and no, you don't know shit. Uh, don't be so. Don't be so arrogant. Be humble. Uh, learn from other people that the world's so much bigger than you think. So don't stay in your little bubble, right? It's just the world's so much more, so much bigger, so much, so much bigger. And, and be you know, be be kind to people, and really, don't be driven by, don't be consumed by success. Don't be consumed by materialistic things that that you don't. It's you can do good and do well and, and help others and still be very, very successful. That's what I would tell my, my 15 year old self. So how else, how else can the listeners um, get in contact with you, connect? Like where else, should we, where else would you like us to send them to to learn more about Dan Locke? And what I, think, I think any, we are on social, of course, yep. YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, you know, Dan Locke search. I'll have all those in the show notes for, uh, for yeah, everybody. That's, that's the best way. And DanLock.com, that's our main website. If you want to go to the main hub, it branches out to everything else. What do we order these Iron Man suits? Because I need to get one for my... Uh, oh, yeah. Sideshow. Sideshow. <laughs> I'm going to pluck my friend Sideshow here. <laughs> Sideshow toys. Sideshow toys. So where do, you see, where do you see marketing going in like the, the 21st century? Like where does it go from here? I think marketing now, because of low bear of entry, everyone is an influencer now, right? Every, everyone is it's, it's, it's a founder. Everyone is a CEO. Uh, it's interesting because you, you look at social media where... A lot of people, they're talking about being entrepreneurship. Like, the entrepreneurship is, like, popular. The buzzword. It's buzzword. I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to do this. I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to do all that. Uh, I actually think we are less than – we are – we are, a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs, but in reality, we are less entrepreneurial than ever. Hmm. Wow. It's, like, the opposite. People like to play entrepreneurship, but they're not entrepreneurs. Well, it goes back to what you said earlier on about when you pull the curtain back and you let people know like how much work is going into your social media, how much work is going into the back end of the business. Yeah. People get scared and they don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. And they don't have a business model. They, have, they think, okay, I'm going to, because anyone can have an Instagram account, right? And they say, I'm going to pull post, post photos, post some motivational stuff. And, and I'm going to, what are going to do? I said, so what's your business model? Well, I don't know. Once I have the fans, I, I'll figure this out. Like they, they lack the very basic business acumen of yeah. what, what value are you providing? What problems are you solving for people? So like that's totally missing. And I hear that a lot with like new companies that start with the intention of being bought, but without the intention of actually building the business. Build like the business. There's, a whole, there's a whole movement of these companies that are really just, they're, they're starting with because they think they want to get bought by venture capitalists, but they don't yeah. care to actually build a company. They just care about their idea, getting it off the ground, selling it. So it, um, yeah, so it just, just another point I wanted to bring up. And then young people, they see people on social media and they say, oh, I want to be like that. They, they see the life, the glitz, the glam, the, the lifestyle. But then what they didn't understand is it took how many years to get there. <laughs> and, and they would start something. Oh man, I'm telling you, one year I'm going to retire. I'm going to sit on the beach, right? I'm going to be drinking my beer. It's going to be cool. Like it's this whole mentality. And, and they, my, my mentor said, Dan Penny, always, it's, it's the f- snowflake generation, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. What snowflake, they melt under pressure. Like they live a bit of that, uh, uh, someone, someone said, uh, they don't like me on social media. They're like, shit. And then they all like, it's they don't trap. understand what it takes. They don't mm-hmm. understand how hard it is. And they have this fantasy of, Oh, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it's, it's not. Well, hard, right? I always love being told like, you know, you're an overnight success, 20 years in the making, those kind of things. <laughs> it's like, what, what's the overnight about it? It's not overnight about it. Right? Exactly. And, There's and, nothing and overnight about even it. for myself, this is for myself. Looking back, if I knew this is what it would take, I probably won't do it. <laughs> Interesting. I, like if I knew what I knew today and this is what it would take, to get to this level, I'm like, I am not saying, hey, sign me up. I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah. But because I'm kind of in, like you're in it, in like halfway, I'm like, you kind of got to kind of keep pushing. And before you knew it, then you are, you, you're it. But it's not, 
it, like if I knew that's what it takes, I'm like probably I, I'm I'm happy with the, a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Well, we're sold the glitz and the glam and we're sold the idea of freedom. Um, but yeah, when you run a successful company like you're running, it, it, there's a lot of time investment. There's a lot to it. And yeah, it's not all clear until you're actually behind the- Dude, uh, you're, you're selling me the idea of having two Iron Man suits behind me. That's what you're selling me on right now. <laughs> Are you sold? Did I close you? <laughs> you're so close me on that. So listen, we got, we got to wrap it up. But before we do, I got to find out, uh, we covered geek news because this is, you know, Marketing Geeks isn't just about geeky in marketing. Uh, I want to find out, number one, what you're geeky about, Dan, this week. Like, what's your thing that you're geeky about? Number two- what did you think of Marvel's rollout of Phase Four? I, well, first of all, I, I watch every single Marvel movie, so I'm a huge fan. Anything Marvel does, I, I, too, I, man. I, I love it. I, I love it. So, so Marvel Phase Four can wait. <laughs> <That's how I laughs> can wait uh, for geek geeky stuff this week. Let me think. I don't collect. I mean, this is what I collect, right? This is the, like the Marvel toys, is, and that's what I order. Um, I had well. One thing, not this week, but one thing I kicked out recently was really what's I know, um, the A86, um, the, the Toyota that I have. Mm. Like, you know, people say, hey, it's my Lamborghini. I say, he's my Toyota. <laughs> 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 he's my Toyota, man. But it's from the animation uh, Initial D. Initial oh. D, which is like the drifting car from the mountain. And, and I love that car because that car is the ultimate underdog story, right? It's a crappy little tofu delivery car that beats all the muscle car, right? When they're going downhill and up the mountain. That's the, the series of Initial D. So that's my little geeky thing that I would say. Oh, that's Love so it. awesome, man. Jesse, what are you geeky about this week? This yeah, I mean, I guess, it's, I guess it's the rollout of Marvel Phase 4. We oh, got yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, yeah, for sure. For sure, yeah. Comic-Con. The Comic-Con, they, they announced, like, all, what, we got, like, a new Thor movie. We got Black Widow. Black uh, Widow, uh, yep. Yeah. Doctor Strange. Yeah, the Doctor TV Strange shows. movie, it's which apparently... Oh, I know what I'm geeky about. Walking Dead movie. Oh, I didn't hear about that one. Okay. Yeah. Rick, really? Rick Grimes, his own Walking Dead movie. You heard it here first. <laughs> Go see that. Well, uh, uh, Justin, uh, you're Marvel 4. I'm Marvel also. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for being on the show, man. And uh, please come back and... Uh, yes. We would love to have you back again. It was so fun. kind of I'm you to fun. take your yeah, time please out. Share, yeah. Please share the interview with your, your 10 million people. Appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. We'll, appreciate we'll share it with our seven. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, All man. right. Thank you so much. Dan Locke, everybody.